All right. Well, hello, everyone. I'm Cesar Barrios, Outreach Director for F1000 Research in the Americas. Um, welcome to the special, this special edition of F1000 Talks, where we'll be talking about sharks, rays, and skates. I am pleased to welcome today uh, Victoria Vasquez, uh, Christy Wilcox, and uh, David Schiffman. Uh, Victoria is a graduate student in the Pacific, at the Pacific Re Shark Research Center, Moss Landing Marine Laboratories. Uh, she's also a marine conservationist and the deputy director of the Ocean Research Foundation. Um, Victoria, uh, could you please tell us a little bit about your research and your role within the Ocean Research Foundation and how this uh, foundation came about? Yeah, definitely. So I started my um, master's thesis uh, at Moss Landing and specifically at the Pacific Shark Research Center, so the acronym there is PSRC, so I'll, I'll just say that from now on. Um, there's a lot of different stuff going on in our lab, but I'm specifically studying the sharks in San Francisco Bay. Um, this population, if you were to look at these sharks, um, there aren't a lot of scientific papers explaining what's going on with these populations that are, and how they're utilizing it. And it's really important for us to understand that because it's surrounded by uh, so, so many people, uh, so much construction. So uh, my master's thesis will be studying one of those populations because um, specifically the one I'll be looking at, the soup fin sharks, um, hasn't been looked at since about the 1940s. Um, now the other thing that I do is the Ocean Research Foundation. So I really feel like it's a, important to have a bridge between science and outreach and I kind of do that outreach through uh, the nonprofit. We're new, we got founded um, last year and our goal is to combine research with education. Now I know that sounds like a really common format for a lot of nonprofits, but one of the big things we're also interested in doing is trying to help out the um, other uh, ocean communities um, within our area. So for example, the San Francisco International Ocean Film Festival, uh, we try to help out there with volunteers and any other way uh, that we can and we try to sort of facilitate that with the other groups um, around here as well. Nice. <clears throat> so, Christy, uh, you're a freelance science writer. You blog for uh, Discovery, um, and you are the author, uh, actually the author for the Science Sushi for Discover blogs. Um, you're a PhD candidate in cell bio at the University of Hawaii. Um, so, I understand you intend to apply the methods developed uh, for pharmacological and medicinal research to ecological and uh, evolutionary questions. Could you tell us a little bit about your research um, and how it pertains to marine biology and conservation? Sure. So um, I don't study sharks. I study lionfish, um, which are a major invasive species off the Atlantic coast in general, throughout the Caribbean. Um, and I actually don't study the invasive ones. I study the native ones. So what I'm looking at is understanding native population dynamics and understanding um, just how lionfish are in general, so understanding a bit more about their biology, um, particularly pertaining to their toxins, to understand uh, the native population so that we can hopefully use that to better uh, drive conservation and management in the invasive population. Oh. <clears throat> and David, um, so you're a graduate student and marine conservationist at the University of Miami, um, whose research focuses on the ecosystem role of sharks, uh, in coastal South Florida, as well as how different stakeholders perceive the ecosystem importance uh, and role of sharks. Um, you're also an active blogger and Twitter user, um, and uh, currently uh, co-editor of one of our uh, article collections that's coming up next week. Can you uh, talk us through a little bit about your your research um, and its intersection with uh, social media, which I think is particularly interesting? Sure. Uh, I'm using a, a variety of tools and an interdisciplinary approach to try to assess uh, some aspects of shark conservation uh, research. As you mentioned, I'm interested in how sharks fit into the food web and how they affect the food web. I use a tool called stable isotope analysis for that. It's a biogeochemical tool that lets you track uh, food as it moves through a food web and non-invasively measure diet. I'm also using social media to measure how different stakeholder groups are talking about shark conservation issues. Nice. <clears throat> so we're going to go into a few questions, uh, additional questions right now. Um, to our audience, uh, if, you, if you want to participate, go ahead and chime in on our, our Q&A box. So Victoria, I'm going to throw this your way. Uh, could you please elaborate um, some of the tools that you use for uh, shark conservation 
uh, what tools have been shown to be effective, uh, which ones uh, ineffective. Any advice for other uh, researchers? Yeah, um, I think the biggest way to make things uh, effective is to think of what you want that take-home message uh, for someone to be when they leave. And then you just keep repeating it. I, I know that sounds kind of kind of weird, um, because oftentimes I think as a scientist, when you're communicating, communicating, you become very concerned, you know, if you've explained the methods right, you get very, very concerned about if um, your results look good, and you become very concerned about if you sound smart. And when you're talking to the, the general audience, uh, someone that maybe not has, does not have all that background experience, what's most important is they're taking home the key home message of your research and your project. And also the best way to do that is to make it fun. So to trying to, to figure out, to, to simplify those key points and to say it in, in a fun way. And so um, when I bring sort of that science heavy stuff into the outreach, um, I'll do things like shark memes. So I've been doing some shark memes because, you know, one of the biggest things that we're seeing right now is as interesting as great white sharks are, uh, the 500 and growing other species of sharks uh, need a lot more attention. And so making it playful with shark memes really helps. And for those that don't know uh, what a meme is, that's basically just some sort of image that has a running theme and maybe like a couple of jokey words in it or something like that. And shark jokes. I love shark jokes. And so I'll tell shark jokes all the time. And the thing is about shark jokes is people think that my jokes are going to be funny. So it's kind of funny for me to like see somebody's face, like kind of like ready for a good joke. It's a completely terrible joke. But in my joke, I probably just talk to you about a pajama shark. Like what kind of shark is always ready for bed? Pajama sharks. Terrible joke. But now you're like, is that a real shark? And yes, it is. So those are some of the methods that I try to use. Very cool. So David, uh, you've done some pretty uh, interesting stuff, some pretty... Uh Gorilla stuff, if you will, uh, like you know, crowdfunding a scene for Sharknado 2. Can you talk to us a little bit about uh, your experience and how others, you know, can uh, can emulate your success? Sure. Uh, I'm fortunate to have a uh, a large following on social media that's interested in sharks and shark conservation issues, and I've been able to use that to help fund some of my research, both with a sci fund challenge project. Uh, and then working with the producers of Sharknado 2 to be listed as the beneficiary of their crowdfunded extra bonus scene in the movie that just came out. It's, it's been a, a way to harness the people of the internet to help do science. Yeah, so Chrissy, you want to chime in on, on crowdfunding? I know this is a, an area of interest of yours. Um, and why perhaps it's, it's become so successful with uh, ecological uh, and conservation research. Sure. I think um, people often sort of assume that people don't care about science or don't like science, but especially the life sciences, people love science. People love animals. People love the outdoors. They love the ocean. They like hiking and all of that. So I think there's a lot of appeal, and people actually want to know the kind of research that is being done on these areas and these animals that they love so much. And I think when you give them the opportunity to say, hey, you want to throw five bucks and understand how this snail species is surviving in this forest, or hey, you know, we want to track sharks and we want to understand where they're going, you know, people really, really, really tune into that, and they actually are like, yeah, you know, I helped with research on sharks. How cool is that? Um, and I think I think it's a really, up until recently, a completely untapped way of, of paying for science. And I think in some ways it's, it's nice because people already pay for science. I mean, we talk about federal grants and all of these things. People already pay for science. But really knowing what you're paying for and choosing which ones you can pay for, I think that has a lot of power um, and a lot of appeal to the public. So there are, so there are different... Uh obviously crowdfunding platforms, different ways of, uh, of uh, rewarding your, your audience, uh, if you will. Um, do you find, you know, are people as receptive to funding research, let's say, if they are not giving a particular physical reward? Uh, are they satisfied with just uh, contributing and, and seeing the research, uh, you know, move through the paces? Or do people a lot of times expect uh, something in return I mean, I think a lot of times it helps to have little incentives, but they don't have to be big. I mean, most people who contribute to crowdfunding campaigns, they don't pay the $1,000 or the $500 or whatever the higher limits are in terms of your, your what you can get out of it. Um, 
it's great if you have something, you know, really big and fun. I know, like, David's, for example, he was able to, to offer um, people, taking people out on the boats when they go and catch sharks, and that's a really, really cool benefit to get. Um, but when it comes to little things, people like just research updates. They they like, you know, um, T-shirts or stickers. I mean, it's amazing what people will do for a sticker. I mean, <laughs> we all like stuff and swag, so. So, Vicki, any thoughts on this? Um, yeah, just what I wanted to say is um, if you are, are doing that stuff and you give people updates exactly like Christy said, I think that they like that. And I think that if you were to compare it to like a band, for example, we're all um, early on in our careers and people like to see, um, watch, watch something grow basically. And so for like a small rock band, for example, people like to say, I liked them back then. And it's fun to kind of see something um, kind of become more and more successful. And I think that is one thing that a lot of people, um, it, it's an incentive for them to want to try to help early uh, scientists in their careers. So, <clears throat> David and Victoria, um, could you briefly summarize the, to the audience members what would happen if uh, shark numbers keep declining at the rate that they are? Um, what ecosystem changes would you see? And, uh, you know, why does this matter to, let's say, a Midwestern family that doesn't have access to the ocean and thus uh, oceans are not as relevant to them as, let's say, uh, someone in a coastal state? Well, sharks are, are uh, in most cases, top predators in their ecosystem. Not always, but in most cases. And predators are always important to keeping an ecosystem healthy. Where I'm from in western Pennsylvania, we used to have wolves. And we killed all the wolves. And now there's too many deer. And all the deer are sick. And all the deer are doing crazy things that they wouldn't otherwise do that cause a great deal of property damage. The same thing can and is happening in the oceans. Uh, when you lose top predators, the food chain can start to unravel. And there's a lot of more subtle effects as well, but predators eat the sick and the weak and the dying. They help keep prey populations in check. And uh, when you don't have that, it's, it's problematic. Hmm. Uh, Victoria? Oop. I think, okay, I'm unmuted. So um, that is um, the, the general issue. And what I've noticed a lot of times is people try to wrap this up into uh, a, a story with like a neat little bow in it. And as a result of that, they make bigger exaggerations. So although that's true, um, and I know uh, David has to fight with this all the time, it's basically uh, misinformation. So what happens is this general story that, that, that is true um, is true in different ways in every single different environment. Um, even with the same shark species, the shark species in one part of the world may behave differently in a different part of the world and they adapt and they change to those situations. And so one of the problems is, is when we over-exaggerate. So for example, one big over-exaggeration was that if we lose our shark populations because they're managing, managing the animals below them, that means that we're going to eventually um, have an over an explosion of plankton, and the plankton is going to kill itself, and plankton, especially specifically phytoplankton, produce oxygen, and now that equals no sharks, no oxygen, we die. And this is sort of oftentimes the story that we try to give to people that aren't by the ocean. However, that's not true. That's, that's not totally how the ecosystem works. And, and although some elements of, of, of that um, simplified story have some accurate points to it, um, it's completely false when you try to wrap it all together. And so I think that's one of the biggest challenges is telling people that when they hear certain stories, they should specifically share that story and not try to wrap it up to the sharks of the entire world. And that happens a lot. Thanks. <clears throat> so Christy, um, I know that you're not uh, specifically a shark researcher. Um, what kind of changes are you seeing in the conservation landscape in Hawaii in general? Um, for example, shark tourism. Um, is it bearing fruit? Can you speak to that? Yeah, so in Hawaii, sharks are really, really important to the local community. I mean, when you talk about native Hawaiians, they were um, amakua, which is sort of like family gods, at the lack of a better way to phrase it. Um, so, so sharks have always been important to, to this local community, and shark fishing, we've 
they've instituted um, shark fishing uh, regulations and bans here in Hawaii um, for shark finning. And shark tourism is actually a major source of debate here because all, some people are like, yay, tourism, we're showing off the sharks. And other people are like, no, you're, you're, you're you know, promoting these fear and you're doing this stuff and you're making the sharks come close and you're causing attacks. And so there's a lot of debate um, about whether or not it's appropriate to have shark tourism here in Hawaii. I think a lot of people who come here for snorkeling and diving love to see sharks. So in that sense, shark tourism is good for Hawaii tourism, and sharks that are being around is good for um, Hawaii tourism. But uh, the shark boats themselves, um, it depends on how they're being done and, and a lot of that sort of stuff. But at the moment, I don't really have any major issues with shark tourism here in Hawaii. Okay. Um, so, you know, you touched upon very briefly on shark finning. So I know this is a major uh, threat to sharks today. Um, are there other, what are the other major threats uh, for sharks uh, and elasmo branks in, in general? Um, do we see the same issues throughout the globe? Or are you facing different issues, for example, in Africa uh, than you do in Hawaii, than you do in South America? Um, David and then Vicky. Well, worldwide, the issues facing sharks are overall pretty similar. Uh, it's, it's overfishing, uh, in many cases, unregulated or improperly regulated overfishing. Though it does vary, of course, by species, and it varies by country. The U.S. has stronger regulations than some places. Uh, some species are more threatened by things like habitat destruction than by overfishing. But in general, no matter where you are, the threats are, are comparable. Any thoughts on this, Vicky? Yeah, he's um, he's absolutely right. But the other thing we have to keep in mind is that um, there are certain species that are doing okay. And since um, so many shark species are following or starting to fall into the zone of critically endangered, um, we need to ignore some of the more charismatic uh, species, if you will. And basically, that again comes back to great white sharks. Um, on the west coast, we've been seeing an increase in their populations. Uh, there was a um, recently a, a, tra a move to try to increase um, uh, regulations on them to increase their protection and that sounds like such a great idea because when, when we think about sharks especially if you're impassioned about them you want to protect them all but the problem is that when you when you start to create these blanketed regulations especially if a, if a species doesn't need it you're taking that away from another species and so what we have to do is highlight the ones that need it and recognize the ones that don't so great white sharks are doing okay <laughs> okay, so a question for, for all three of you. Um, how do you foresee your research, uh, either in, uh, in, in lionfish or in sharks, uh, benefiting from uh, open data uh, uh, and, uh, and the data that you can acquire, for example, from sources like Twitter? Um, and, uh, you know, and I know that you, David, for example, have published, your, your lab, for example, publishes everything in open access. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, Christy, uh, Victoria, and then we'll come back to you, David. Well, um, I think open access is great. Um, I, the more we can have uh, research accessible to anyone who wants to read it and understand it um, is great. On the other hand, there are some issues when it comes to open access in terms of how much it costs for the you know, new scientists and, and other things that are important to consider, impact factors for journals that are important to consider for the researchers. Um, but from the public standpoint, I think open access is great, and I think the more that we can encourage uh, journals and uh, even universities to pay for open access options, the better. Vicki? <clears throat> Okay, I'm un I'm un I'm unmuted, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I am also uh, totally in support of open access, sharing information. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting is these opportunities um, to have citizen scientists to to basically bring in uh, people from maybe not stringent scientific backgrounds, but perhaps are utilizing the ocean every day. And I think this is a really interesting way to get more um, information about sharks and also to get people from different backgrounds more involved. So um, I'm really big in trying to uh, collaborate with some of the fishermen in, in San Francisco Bay. It's something that I'm, I'm trying to work on a, a little bit more, but 
uh, when you get more people involved, they, they kind of want to see that change happen with you as opposed to it being more polarized. And also when that data is an open access and you have somebody that was maybe involved in the project, it makes it easier for them to share it because when you have a paper that goes online, um, if it's not open access, you can share the link but if you're not affiliated with a university or you are you know, paying the yearly dues for that specific journal, um, you've limited the audience that can learn about that. And, and sometimes that's unfortunate. And David, your thoughts? Well, as you said, um, all of our lab's papers are shared on our lab website. Anyone can read them uh, regardless of whether or not they have journal access. Uh, and that's, that's been helpful for us, both in terms of getting the word out there to our colleagues, because many, we focus on a lot of practical research issues, and even not other, many other researchers, particularly in the developing world, don't have access to all of these journals. But it's an, also been helpful for getting media coverage and working with conservation groups, working with the public. Uh, so it it's, uh, re has been really helpful for us to be able to share our research in this way. All right, so I want to take these last uh, few minutes to talk a little bit about uh, the Shark uh, Research Collection that uh, you, David, are co-editing with uh, Charles Bangley. Um, and then talk a little bit about uh, Shark Week and your thoughts. So sort of what is your, I mean, um, what do you hope to achieve with this collection uh, over time? And, uh, and to Victoria, what type of research would you like to see published uh, in this collection or otherwise? Uh, regarding shark conservation and ecology? Well, this collection includes a variety of different uh, papers written by scientists about a huge variety of topics uh, ranging from age and growth uh, to fisheries management policy to even just a, a sighting of a shark species, not where it's supposed to be or when it's supposed to be. And this is all very important information and we hope it'll help uh, further some ongoing discussions about shark conservation and shark research. Um, yeah, I, I agree with David. I'm excited to see all those things on the um, um, on this new website. Um, the other thing that I'm interested in is I know you guys mentioned you know you're going to be doing like reviews um, and stuff of that nature, and I think that's really great because oftentimes, even for me, when I'm reading a scientific paper, it could have it could do with sharks, but sharks is actually uh, you know a very broad field. You know, for example, you know, David mentioned he studies stable isotope analysis, whereas somebody else could be looking at a, a different aspect that still involves sharks. And so it's kind of nice sometimes when you have a review, something that kind of simplifies the work and, and helps somebody understand it who may not be an expert on it. And when you have a scientific paper, it's for the other experts, basically. So um, I'm looking forward to sort of reviews and, and things that make it kind of easier to digest uh, some of that, you know, more complicated jargon. Okay, great. <clears throat> well, Chrissy, we don't only limit ourselves to shark research on our on our uh, journal. Um, for yourself, what kind of uh, research would you like to see more uh, publications uh, about? Uh, in general, I'm really intrigued and excited about some of the stuff that, for example, David is working on, but the intersection between sort of social science and science, science, or whatever you want to call it, um, lab sciences and, and field sciences. I'm really intrigued by um, understanding, for example, how conversations change over time on the internet, looking at social media and data mining, and especially now with, with open, open data and big data. I think there's a lot of really powerful and cool things that you can do to track um, behaviors and attitudes over time using the internet. And I'm, I'm really intrigued to see some of that stuff come out. Cool. Okay, so now to the fun part, Shark Week. <laughs> what are your thoughts about it? Um, so, I mean, I'll start with a testimonial. Uh, I grew up loving Shark Week. I grew up with uh, just watching the Discovery Channel. It's probably my favorite channel when I was growing up. Um, I wanted to be the next Jacques Cousteau. So, unfortunately, the, the quality of the program has declined somewhat. So, what are your thoughts on it? Um, you know, what are your favorite... Uh, shows that are coming out in this uh, year's edition. Um, we'll just go down the line, Christy, and then we'll go to David, and then finally Victoria. So this year, um, there are going to be some shows that are probably worth watching. Uh, I know the other two will mention this, but Alien Sharks is one of the ones that I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how, how it does. Um, on the other hand, there are a few things that are kind of concerning. Um, there is a new Megalodon special, the new evidence, which is listed right on Discovery's website amongst all of their 
real science shows um, without any sort of disclaimer. We lost Christy again. We lost Christy. Okay, let's uh, well, let's try and move down the the line, David. Uh, fully, she'll be back up soon. Mm -hmm. This happened to her yesterday. Ah. Uh, wait, me, me next or Vicky? Yeah. So you go next, and then. Vicky. Yeah, I, I just want to echo what Christy said. Uh, there, Alien Sharks, uh, which features a member of Vicky's lab, is looks like it's going to be just fantastic. The Alien Sharks last year was definitely the highlight. I'm glad to see they brought that back. But I was very distressed to see that they brought back another Megalodon nonsense. Uh, there's absolutely no doubt whatsoever that Megalodon is extinct. Claiming otherwise is blatantly lying. Uh, and it scares people. And it also takes attention away from real issues. When they make up nonsense like this, what they're saying is, we don't think the real world is interesting enough, uh, which is offensive to me as a biologist and naturalist. So, and then there's some other stuff this year. Zombie sharks, in particular, looks like it looks to be promoting animal animal harassment. Uh, it's not uh, not really a good idea. But there's some stuff that's going to be good. There's some stuff that's going to be really, really bad. And Vicky, your thoughts? No okay. Um. Well, yes. Like they mentioned, uh, my lab mate um, Paul Clerkin is going to be um, very heavily featured on Alien Sharks this. Um, this year, so I'm really excited for that show. And let me just tell you why. So, um, I don't know if they're going to go into the show, but I, w I just want to tell you the background on, on this. So, first of all, I, I went into this a lot with the um, Online Ocean Symposium when we were talking yesterday about this divide between like activists, scientists, fishermen, which I think is kind of silly because our roots oftentimes are very similar. He's working with fishermen and he's using their bycatch. And, Based on this by bycatch, um, the uh, I think two years ago when he he went out, he collected um, eight new species of deep sea shark. I'm really excited to figure out how you know like how many new species, if any, he found this time. But that was only possible if, if these fishermen were willing to um, make some sort of relationship with him and not be scared that this uh, data would be used uh, against them. And at the same time, you know, Paul can't speak to what will happen with future fishing regulations. It was just, it's just this really nice moment that, you know, they were both willing to work together. And it's, you know, really helped uh, um, ocean research. In addition to that, the information that Paul is collecting isn't actually just going to his master's thesis. This is going to two other master's thesis in my lab, as well as two undergraduate research projects. So it's just really amazing what can be collected from just one boat trip. And so what you're going to be seeing in Alien Shark is going to be contributing to a whole lot of different research and all of it going to Deep Sea Sharks. So it's going to be really cool. Awesome. <clears throat> awesome. Yeah. So um, two minutes. Uh, really quick, who would be your dream team of uh, shark researchers to appear on Shark Week? Ooh. Um, well, I want to see a lot more women on there, for one. One of the things that bothers me about Shark Week is that you see all of these, I guess, at the lack of a better word, big burly guys or whatever, wrangling sharks and, and all of this. And I know there are a lot of really awesome girls out there doing really awesome research on sharks. And so, um, for me, the, the top priority would to see some a little more diversity in terms of the researchers. Great. Uh, to add to that, our research team of uh, undergraduate interns, about two-thirds of them are female. All of them are way better at wrangling sharks than I am. We had, some, <laughs> we had a journalist who came out with us and said, hey, you were reeling in that shark. Why did you hand it to that little girl? And I said, well, first of all, don't call her that. And second of all, it's because she's way better at handling sharks than I am and way stronger than me. Of course I'm going to give it to her. Uh, I would also, yeah, there's, there's a real lack of diversity on Shark Week hosts, which is they sort of called attention to this with their ridiculous promo this year, The King of Summer, which shows uh, a, a guy in a, a bathing suit and a bikini-clad, someone who may even be dressed as a mermaid, I'm not really sure, right, clutching his leg and smiling ridiculously. Uh, apparently in the Shark Week universe, that's the only thing that uh, females can be used for. So uh, that's not good. And Vicky, final thoughts? Uh, can you see me, or is it just my voice? I can only see your voice right now. I don't know. Oh, okay. Too bad. Well, um, in any case, 
Um, I'm uh, also with Love in a Dream Team Diversity. Uh, I am a Latina shark researcher, so that'd be cool to see some more Latinos um, doing anything. That'd be pretty awesome. And, and just people that are studying some of these lesser known sharks would be really great. And yes, not having promos where the woman featured is basically clutching someone's shins. That was a real bummer to watch in that commercial. I mean, especially when they did the commercial over and were making it like a joke, why not at least in one of the jokes have like a guy there? I think it just kind of unfortunately just kind of re-emphasizes that sort of stereotype of um, how we see women and that is really depressing. And so I would like to see us do the opposite. Okay. Well, I think our time is up. Um, I'd like to thank uh, all three of you for uh, for joining us and you know, for such an exciting uh, conversation. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, if you're if we have audience members watching, um, feel free to um, you know to uh, send us any questions or contact Christy, uh, David, and uh, and Vicky. Uh, by Twitter or through their blogs. Actually, I have one question from an audience member. They're asking, "Oh, great! Which are the most threatened shark species?" Sawfish. <laughs> They're not really um, technically a shark. They are part of the Lasmobranchs. Um, when me and David were at the uh, shark research conference, uh, one of the researchers created a hashtag um, as sort of a nod to David's. Uh, social media work and it was hashtag raise need love too with the number two at the end and basically it was just uh, pointing out the fact that um, there are a lot more animals that are critically endangered all the sawfish are critically endangered and uh, in addition to that um, they were even thinking of calling rays flat sharks just to bring them back into that shark conversation so I thought yeah. that was kind of funny okay well I think with this we'll wrap it up uh, thank you uh, once again for joining us, and uh, and stay tuned for another uh, edition of these uh, special editions F1000 talks through uh, Google Hangouts. All right. Have a good afternoon, guys. Bye. Thanks for having us. Bye. Bye.